Amen. Uh, before we dive into God's Word, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward. We wanted to give a chance for those that uh, were going to give to uh, the building fund today or the debt payoff today uh, to have a chance for us to do that today. I know some uh, are going to be giving online. There is a link um, that you can go to. If you go to our regular giving page online, there's a drop box there. You can choose general fund or the debt payoff fund. Uh, if you want to give online, feel free to do that. If you're watching online, you can go uh, to the link give now uh, in the uh, description below um, the uh, the feed um, and you can uh, give through the online offering um, and then also if you're not prepared to give today or you're not prepared to give at this moment uh, if you want to give in the boxes if you can just dis just distinguish that from your regular general offering um, and we also have building fund envelopes in uh, the on the connect desk outside and so but we wanted to give a special time for anybody that so we could have a special time in the service so we can designate this offering as opposed to uh, our weekly offering for today and just as a reminder this offering is to pay off our 36,000 of remaining debt uh, that we had for a renovation loan that we used to, uh, to, to make this space, uh, the space we use on a regular basis, the weekly basis uh, for worship and for gathering together uh, to use this uh, so we could re remodel this space. And so that's what this is going towards. We're looking to pay off this $36,000 by the end of this year. Starting today, uh, we're taking up that offering uh, with the purpose of marking that uh, twenty uh, that $24,000 line item off our budget for 2022. And so um, that's what we're going to do now. And so what I want to do is pray, and then we're going to quickly take up an offering, and then we'll dive into God's Word together. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for the blessing of our church family, God, and the blessing of this building, God, that, that, that we have the opportunity to gather in every week, God, and throughout the week uh, to worship you, to learn more about you, to teach our kids how to follow you. Uh, and, and, and God, to, to utilize for uh, the purpose of making your name known in this place and, and ultimately around the world. So, God, as we give, uh, I pray, God, that we give uh, from uh, the abundance of what you have given us, God, and that we give sacrificially and cheerfully, Father, knowing that you intend to use what is given for your glory and for the good of your kingdom. Uh, and so, God, right now, help us to give. Uh, and help us uh, what is given to honor you uh, and God to be uh, to be a gift father uh, to your kingdom and the purposes of your kingdom here in this place in this church God thank you for Jesus we ask all this in his name amen All right. Well, thank you, guys. Um, and as I said, we will be taking that offering up until the end of this year with the hopes of paying uh, off the debt by the end of this year. And we will give updates as uh, the, the, the months move on. And so uh, just be in prayer for that. And, uh, um, and also be in prayer, as I've talked about before, for how God may move in us uh, to utilize the, uh, the, what we are no longer allocating for uh, the purpose of paying off that loan. So... Um, John chapter 12 is where we'll find ourselves today. John 12, if you will turn in your Bible uh, to John chapter 12, um, and uh, we'll dive in today. Uh, John chapter 12 um, is, there, or this, I'm sorry, this week, this sermon, I kind of consider a bridge sermon. Um, we have, over the last several weeks, we've been talking about uh, the, the being generous with the, the money that God has given us, the, our financial generosity, uh, giving and and, 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 and and to, to the mission of God in this world and being generous with what God has given us. But next, I want to transition over the next couple, the next few weeks to talking about how we can serve, like generosity in our service, how we can use our time and our gifts and our talents and all that God has, in, in, has empowered us with for the purpose of uh, his kingdom. And so being generous with, uh, with um, our giftedness, if you will. And so over the next several weeks, starting next week, we're going to talk about spiritual giftedness, what it means to be spiritually gifted, how we use our gifts, um, what are the gifts that, that we should be looking for in ourselves. 
how do we discover those gifts and our attitude towards those? Uh, and then talking about serving. What does it mean to serve in the church and serve uh, the Lord here? And, in, and not just in the context of the church, but how, does it, how, how should we serve others in just our everyday lives, at our job, in our neighborhoods, and all that kind of stuff? So um, that, this, this, in a sense, is a, a bridge towards that. And so uh, John chapter 12, we're going to talk about the power of generosity. What, is it, what does it mean? To, what, what is that idea, the power of generosity? And so if you uh, will turn to, to John chapter 12, before we get there, um, in, in, 19, in 1632, um, a uh, Mongol emperor named Shah Jahan, the, the Mughal Empire, or, empire, or it's different Mughal or Mughal or whatever it is, um, it, it, however you want to say it, was an empire that, that was predominantly in India, but even in Afghanistan and Pakistan in that area of the world in the 1600s, it's a powerful empire. And the emperor there at that time was a man named Shah Jahan. Uh, and in 1632, he commissioned the, the building of this huge memorial complex in honor of his favorite wife. Isn't it funny to think about favorite wife? Like, I only have one favorite wife because I only have one wife. But he had multiple wives, and, and his favorite wife, the one that was the most special to him, when she passed away, uh, he wanted to build something uh, that, that, that showed how much he loved and honored her. Um, and so he commissioned this huge memorial complex, 42-acre complex. It took 20 years to build it. The estimated value of, like, in modern-day uh, amounts is up to uh, estimated value is, or estimated cost to build was a billion dollars. The B, not an M, a billion dollars. And, and the centerpiece of this 42-acre complex is the 32,000-plus mausoleum that houses the tombs of Jaha and, or Jahan and his beloved wife. We know it as the Taj Mahal. And the Taj Mahal is a structure most of us in the world is, are familiar with. You've probably seen pictures of it. Some of you may actually have been there. I, I was in Delhi um, back in 2007, and it's not very far from Delhi, but we weren't able to go to the Taj Mahal. But it's an incredible building, an incredible complex, complex these big gardens and these big walls and this, this stone uh, structure that uh, is at the middle, the, the, the middle of the whole building. You, you guys probably have seen uh, pictures of, of that. Um, but this, this structure was built for one person. Now, obviously, nowadays, after he died, he was also buried there, but ultimately it was commissioned. A billion-dollar structure was commissioned for one person. Twenty years, thousands of people working on it. If you were to estimates of, of how much it would cost to replace the Taj Mahal today, the estimates range from $10 billion to up to a trillion dollars in order to, to, if it was wiped out, in order to replace it with what it is today. It seems like kind of a extravagant thing for one person, right? Maybe over the top, maybe a little bit too much. Like why in the world would anybody spend that kind of money, do that much work just to honor one person? But for Jahan, one of the most powerful and wealthy men of his age in the world at that time, it was worth it. She was worth it. And, and, but it begs the question, how do we determine the value of something? How do we determine how much something is worth to us? How do we determine or how do we express how precious something is to us, how important something is to us? I, I used to manage a thrift store in Fargo, and, and, and that was kind of the decision we have to make often. Like, how much is this piece of furniture Going, how much is it worth uh, to someone that we can price it and they'll buy it? How much is, is this shirt worth to someone that we can price and they will buy it? You know, there, there's this value judgment that we make all the time. And, and we as people make value judgments all the time, all day, every day. We, we, we make values not just in, we, we not value judgments not in just how we spend our money, but also how we spend our time, how we spend our resources, how we, how we, how we spend our giftedness and our talents that God has given us. We, we make value you judgments all day every day 
And, and you can clearly see in us what we value by how we spend our time and our money and our giftedness. What, what do we serve and, and, and how are we serving in those things? Now, obviously, some of the things that might be popping in your mind is Jeremy saying that the only thing that, that, that value, the only, the only value that you have uh, in life is what you do inside the context of the church or it, what giving to the church and serving. I'm not saying that, okay? I've not said that from the beginning of this series, and I'm not going to continue to say it now. I believe God has, has, has saved us and, and has brought us together that we may be generous with our finances, not just inside the context of the church, but everywhere we go giving to those in need, giving to, to organizations that are serving uh, the needs of others that, that are expressing the kingdom of God in tangible ways. I believe our service and the way God gifts us is not just to serve in the context of the church. It is to serve in the context of the church, but it's also to serve in the jobs that you have. God has gifted you uniquely, spiritually gifted you uniquely in a variety of ways for you to serve in the places that he has you. Now, I'm getting ahead of the game here a little bit, but, but understand that as we talk about this power of generosity, God doesn't necessarily want to just focus on what we do on Sundays and Wednesdays, but at what we do with our entire lives and how we serve in all aspects of our lives and how we give in all aspects of our lives. And generosity is a powerful thing. The Bible teaches in this passage we look at that generosity is a powerful thing. So let's read from John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. It's going to be on the screen in the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, if you want to read along with me. But here's how it reads. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. That gives you a little context if you didn't know this already. But John chapter 11, uh, which is right before John chapter 12, thank you, Captain Obvious. Uh, John chapter 11 is when Jesus raises Lazarus from the grave. He, he, uh, the account of Jesus raising Lazarus from the grave is right before this. And, and even if you're reading it, there's, there's not this, main, this, this major transition that happens. Jesus raises uh, Lazarus from the dead. There's a plot to kill Jesus. And then all of a sudden we get to, uh, to, to, John, to John chapter 12. Six days before the Passover. And it says, so they gave a dinner for him there. Assuming that's Lazarus. And then, as it mentions, Mar Martha was serving them. And Lazarus was one of them reclining at the table. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were from the town of Bethany. And so Jesus was in Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so after that happened, they said, well, let's throw a party in honor of Jesus. It says, then Mary took a pound of perfume, pure and expensive nard, anointed Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. So the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Then one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was about to betray him, said, why wasn't this perfume sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, uh, but because he was a thief. He was in charge of the money bag and would steal part of it, uh, of what was in it, uh, or part of what was put in it. Jesus answered, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I do thank you for your word, and I pray right now as we read it and understand it, uh, God, as, it, as, as you reveal it to us, God, that we would be impacted by it in a way that can only be explained as you uh, speaking to us, God. May you use it for your glory and for our good. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't know how much time's passed necessarily from the, the time that, that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead until uh, this, this thing, but some, something had ha some time had passed, and, and, and Mary and Martha and Lazarus had decided we need to throw a party for Jesus. And as we find out in, in the account between uh, Matthew and Mark, this party likely happened in Bethany at uh, a guy named Simon's house, Simon the leper. Likely someone Jesus had, uh, had, uh, had healed uh, from his leprosy at another time. And so they named him Simon the leper, although he no longer had leprosy because Jesus healed him. But, but Jesus is in Bethany. They're throwing this party. And, and then we kind of get this picture of, of how things sort of uh, worked out. First off, in verse 2, we see that Martha is serving. 
Uh, and, and, and this, it kind of harkens back and, and, and gives us a flashback to Luke chapter 10 when we first meet Mary and Martha. Uh, Ma- Mary and Martha are in Bethany. Jesus comes through Bethany and they want to serve him. They want to have him over for, for a meal. And so Jesus comes over to their house and as they're eating, Martha is serving and, and she's running around like a chicken with his head cut off and she's serving and doing all that she can do. Um, and then she starts to get frustrated, right? Because she looks over and sees Mary, her sister, at the feet of Jesus just listening listening to him teach. And Martha, she finally says something. She says, Jesus, are you not going to say something to her? Will you tell her to get off her butt and come help me work? You remember what Jesus says. Jesus says, Mary's doing exactly what she needs to do doing. Martha, you're busy working and, and you're busy, but she's doing exactly what she needs to be doing. Here we see Martha is serving again, but she's not serving with that bitterness and that frustration. There's a different spirit about Martha in this moment, right? And it also says that Lazarus is reclined at the table with Jesus, the one that Jesus had has raised from the grave, the one that was dead, and he was in the grave, and Jesus came to the grave after he had been dead for a time, and, and he comes and he, and he says, open the grave, and Martha says the famous words, but Lord, he stinketh, right? And, and yet he, abs- he asks them to open the grave, and then with just a, a, a short statement, G- God raises Lazarus from the grave, and he walks out with his grave clothes on, and and. and, and and, and this amazing thing happens. And just a few days later, here he is sitting at the table, reclining at the table with Jesus. And now, sometimes I think we get, we, we, there, it's important to visualize what's going on here. Like in, this, in this, this culture, the way that they would eat meals, like especially when they were having a dinner party like this, w- w- they weren't going to eat a meal sitting at a table and chairs, uh, everybody sitting around the table like we would today. Right? I mean, we, we kind of get this visualization that Jesus and the disciples are, are all sitting around a table with their feet underneath the table and, and somehow Mary kind of crawls underneath the table and starts pouring stuff on his feet and washing his feet and 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 then you know that it's like all this incredible you know all this amazing or maybe it's like an, an oriental uh, or an asian sort of cultures where they're all sitting on their knees and 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 but that's not how it happens actually what's going happen what's happening here is they're they're likely reclining in the sense of like everybody's kind of bent over on pillows and around the table with on their left hand side as they're eating with their right hand and all their feet are facing outward from the table. And likely the table's in this U-shaped form so that the, those that are serving can come from the middle of the table and serve those around the table. And they have an entryway in and out of the table. And that's likely how things would have, have looked. So get that kind of picture in your brain. Jesus and Lazarus are at this table. They're reclining at the table on one elbow as they're eating and they're talking and, 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 and fellowshipping together. And then all of a sudden we see in verse 3, not necessarily all of a sudden as in like she just bursts in the room, but nonetheless, here comes Mary. Mary comes into the room with a pound of expensive perfume, as it says here in, uh, in John. In, in Mark and Matthew, the, they said it's an alabaster jar full of expensive nard, uh, or, uh, nard, sorry, and that's also what John says, this expensive perfume that comes from India, right? It's exported in from India. And so she brings in this alabaster jar, which is likely a jar that has this long, thin neck that would, would, would not allow for, for, for pouring of ointment out of or, or pour, pour, uh, perfume out of this jar and so in order for her to pour it she would have had to break the jar she would have had to break it open in order for her to pour it out right and so when she breaks it open there's an, an assumption here that she intends to use the whole thing not just a little bit of it and so Mary brings in this jar maybe she's already broken or maybe it's like this like grand entrance where she comes in and she breaks it on the side of the table and then she starts I don't know exactly sometimes I like to imagine things that are a little bit more intense maybe than they actually were but nonetheless she breaks it open and she begins to pour this this perfume on Jesus's feet and and John records that as she began pouring it on his feet she also started to wipe his feet with her hair and and the oddness of this scene isn't lost on us right i mean it would be off-putting if you were sitting in a dinner party and somebody walked in with a bottle of perfume and started like breaking it open and pouring it on somebody's feet and then starts like wiping it with their hair i mean that's not it's odd right i mean it would be kind of awkward like hey what what's she doing (laughs) 
why are you doing that? You know, I mean, it would be off-putting for us. I mean, but, but here, this is, there, there's another layer of this. Like, it's not necessarily odd culturally for someone to be washing someone's feet. They lived in a culture where everybody wore sandals and walked around on these sandy or muddy roads where animals were also freely roaming along with human beings and doing what animals do, right? I don't have to go into details. You understand what I'm saying. And so when you would walk into someone's house, they, there would be a place for you to wash your feet. And, and if they were wealthy enough, they would have a servant that would wash your feet for you. And it was the lowliest of all jobs for the people. It, it was the, the worst of all jobs. It was, it was quite a... Um, a degrading thing for you to wash feet. Then to add in that she was doing it with her hair is extra exceptional, right? So though it wouldn't be odd for someone to wash someone's feet, but the way that she was doing it, and, and even the timing that she was doing it as, was what made it such a shocker to those watching in the room. And Judas, one of the disciples, one of Jesus' followers, the one who would ultimately betray him, as John points out. He comes, he, 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 he argues, he begins to argue that Mary has done something entirely wasteful. Pouring out perfume that was worth what would equate to, a 300 dollars would, would be equate to about a year's wages. 50, 60,000 in modern day understandings if you take just the average sort of income for an American, or especially a Kentuckian, 45 to 55, 60,000 um, dollars would be a general idea of the average income for, uh, for a Kentuckian. A lot could have been done with that amount of money, right? John is obviously writing this account long after this actually thing, this, this happened. So he makes a statement in verse 6. He, he points out like, hey, listen, Judas was a thief. So he didn't say this because he gave, a, gave any care about the poor. He was a thief. And now maybe it, that's a hindsight comment. Like I, we found out later that he was stealing out of the, the very thing that, that they were giving to. Like he was stealing money for himself out of it. Or maybe it was something that they knew then and they, weren't, they hadn't got to a level where they were ready to, uh, to say something about it. But nonetheless, Judas, he, he's wanting to point, li- point out here. He's wanting to highlight here that, 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 that Judas was not... Uh, the, the person that you would want to say has a lot of integrity behind his comment. But John sees the significance of the comparison between Mary and, and Judas here, and he wants to highlight it. So then Jesus speaks up and somewhat surprisingly defends Mary. I say it's surprising because there's a reality to what Mary is doing here, right? And what Judas says, I mean, it's not wrong. If you imagine, like, Jesus is a Jew. He's read the same passages that Judas has read. He knows the Bible probably better than anybody in the room because he was a, portion, a part of the authoring of it, even the Old Testament. And so Jesus knows the, 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 the commands about taking care of the poor and, and, and God's prophecy about how if we don't take care of the poor that, 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 that he doesn't hear our, our, our rituals and our sacrifices, that he, he doesn't take those into account because we haven't taken care of the plight of the poor. And so Jesus knows those things. He is, I mean, G- Judas is right. There could have been a lot done for the poor with that fifty or $60,000. So why would he so firmly defend her and so decidedly rebuke Judas? He says, leave her alone. And I think there's three reasons he says, leave her alone. He says the first one here is, so that she might keep it for my burial, verse 7. He says, stop Judas. Let her affection for me flow unhindered. Do not infect her mind with the sins of your heart. Jesus was both scolding Judas for his unbelief and idolatry and encouraging Mary to not let Judas' sin, Judas's sin diminish her devotion to him. And then in verse 8, he says, You always have the poor. And that's a, that's a reason in and of itself. He says, Stop, Judas. If you really meant that, then you have the rest of your life to serve the poor. In reality, Judas didn't care about the poor. He cared about squeezing everything he could out of this life. And then finally, the, 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 the third reason that Jesus gives is you do not always have me. Related to the second, but he says, stop, Judas. Mary understands how gloriously valuable I am. 
Mary understands that Jesus is the more precious one. He is more precious than anything we can dream up in our minds or buy with our checkbooks. Jesus understands what Mary's doing, and, and he understands that the generosity that she's expressing is powerful. And I think it's powerful in three ways. The first way is this. Generosity has the power to reveal our treasures, to reveal what we really treasure. See, it reveals, it reveals our, our treasure in that we can see in our willingness to be generous just how much we value any given thing in our lives. See, if I struggle to be generous with my time, my money, my resources in serving other people, I'm revealing how much I treasure my own stuff. Likewise, if I'm generous with my time or my money or my resources in serving others, I, I, I'm expressing the worth of my service and sacrifice of my time, my resources, and my money. Let me explain what I mean by that. You can see the heart of generosity in the comparison between Mary and Judas. Look at Mary to first to start off with. To understand what exactly Mary was doing is powerful as we understand the, the thing that she is giving up. This was perhaps something this alabaster jar was perhaps something that the family had to decide how to use maybe it was connected to uh, the family uh, in, in an heirloom sort of way maybe somebody gave it and it was passed down from generation to generation or it was it was something that they saved up that they can invest in and and utilize for something powerful or something uh, 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 something important later on in uh, in life or, or or whatever it was this this likely was a family decision. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were living, in, in, in living together, more than likely, from what we can assume. And so this alabaster jar that was worth fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 in modern idea, that this, this was likely a decision that they had to make together that, that, that they sat down and, and tried to figure out how they could honor this man, this Jesus who had raised Lazarus from the grave, who, who, had, who had done such amazing works, who had taught them how to live and how to, to, to love one another. And, and so Mary, Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus likely had to sit down and decide, or perhaps they had to sit down and decide what they were going to do. And Mary says, what about the alabaster jar? What if we express our love and our devotion to him as we sitting out around the table and we pour this jar and I wipe my... And, and so we, we don't hear, the reason I say that is we don't hear Martha uh, complaining or Lazarus grabbing her arm before she pours it out. Martha saying, Mary, what are you doing? Why would you do that? Or Lazarus grabbing her arm and saying, no, 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 Mary, we're not going to do that. That's our family's livelihood. Rather, they seem like they're joining in. See, this alabaster jar, as I was reading different commentaries this week, this alabaster jar was significantly significant and costly treasure for Mary and potentially had great meaning. It could have been a dowry. Some authors say that it was potentially a dowry that would be used for giving her up in marriage. And so what Mary could have been doing when she is pouring that, that uh, perfume on Jesus' feet, what she could be doing is giving up her chance at marriage or at least making it a lot more challenging for her to get married. It could have been her inheritance. It could have been some kind of family inheritance. They could have been giving up their standing and position in society as she poured out that perfume on Jesus' feet. It could have been their very livelihood. I mean, this could have been like their plan for, for how they were going to survive the next year, to pay the rent and, and, and buy their food and take care of the things around the house. It could have been their very livelihood that she was pouring on Jesus' feet. But in this, you see no hesitation. No hesitation in Mary. For Mary, her love for Jesus had, has, has grown to match his immeasurable value. Jesus is more valuable than finding the right spouse, than finding the right house, than being rich or important, or even able to live comfort, comfortably every or day to day. How difficult 
a place that is to be, to come to. And then you see in comparison, Judas, this, this work of generosity, this act of generosity reveals in Judas his self-focused embrace of the values of this world. Framed in what seemed to be the world's compa- or like, or, or, sorry, the, the words of compassion for the poor, Judas is both pandering to the crowd. That's what John is pointing out. He's pandering to the crowd like a politician, saying things to make him sound like a caring person. But all the while, his true desire is to get more stuff that he thinks will make his life better. There's a valuation in what Judas is saying. He knows how much that perfume's worth, and he knows that if he had a hold of it, he could be a lot better off. Jesus doesn't value Jesus. Likely at one point in his time with Jesus, he did value him. When he thought, this Messiah, this is, this is the one who's supposed to overthrow the Roman government and, and become king, and I want to make sure I'm with him. I want to make sure I'm a close follower of this guy. But when he realized, when he came to realize that Jesus wasn't going to become the king that he thought he was going to become, and, 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 and he wasn't going to, to rule like he thought he was going to rule, Judas wasn't going to gain power, and he wasn't going to gain wealth, and he wasn't going to gain position. His allegiance and his enthusiasm began to fade. Judas no longer saw Jesus as someone that served his needs and he no longer had a need for Jesus. He didn't serve his needs in the way that he desired. Here's the thing. Generosity reveals our treasure. If someone looked deeply at your life today, what would they say holds the most value to you? What is your alabaster jar? Is it comfortable, safe lifestyles? Is it dreams of the future, retirement, marriage, successful children? Is it money? Is it success? Is it recognition? What is your alabaster jar? It's not just what we spend our money on. It's what we spend our time and our attention and, our, and, and what, what keeps us up at night. What's your alabaster jar? Not only does generosity have the power to reveal our treasure, it also has the power to reorient our purpose. Look at verse 8. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. Mary's actions are unconventional, right? I mean, they're, they're, it's, even in that culture, it was unconventional. And even seen by those watching as absolutely foolish. And it wasn't just Judas who thought her, her, her actions were foolish. If you read Matthew's account in verse 8 and 9 of of chapter 26, it says, And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. You hear those words, and what Matthew says is it's not just that, that Judas was upset. The whole disciple, all the disciples were upset. Judas was just the spokesperson. She looked like a fool to the entire room, besides Mary and, or besides Martha and Lazarus, potentially. And Jesus, I think in verse 8, what Jesus is doing is challenging our priorities. We don't always waste our time doing pointless, menial things. Like you're not, uh, most of us here today, they, we work full-time jobs. You're taking care of your family. You're doing things. You're, you're, you, we, are, we are not wasting our time doing menial things. Now, there are some, I mean, I know for me, I have things in my life that is a waste of my time. I am doing menial, pointless things. But Jesus is not saying like, hey, listen, the poor is not important. He knows the Old Testament verses. He's not saying that that, that the poor are not important. What he is saying is that Mary has her priorities in order. Generosity leads us to give up, postpone, or reorganize good things for greater opportunities. I, w- I want you to hear that. Like, like generosity, like true biblical generosity leads us to give up, postpone, or reorganize good things for great, greater opportunities. 
There are things that God is calling us to do, calling us to in our lives that is going to require us to not do something else or to postpone doing something else. And the world around us is going to say, well, that's foolish. Why would you do that? And they're going to have really good reasons for why you shouldn't or you should do these things. But if we look at Scripture, Jesus is saying, but make sure you keep your priorities in order and you keep your purpose in order. Sure, there were chores to be done, work to accomplish. Yes, she had given something that was tremendous value to her family and to herself something that would potentially alter the future, her future in ways that she may not recover from. And yes, she was going to look like a fool for the, to those watching, but it was all worth it. The other important things could wait. They'd still be there when he was gone. Perhaps the things she was saving for and hoping for were not going to happen because of her decision. And yet people were going to probably uh, stare and whisper and point at her and make fun of her for what she was doing. But, but she was confident in her purpose that very moment. See, the way Jesus doesn't always make sense to those who are outside of the world. Generosity has the power to redefine our purpose in ways that are upside down and inside out from those who are watching from the outside. As Mary was giving of this thing, this, this perfume, what she's saying is my purpose is greater than just saving this for another day. My purpose is greater than just serving my own needs. Jesus is worth it. Generosity has the power to free us to live without regret and, to, and, and with a purpose so much bigger than we can ever imagine. Some are going to call us crazy, naive, stupid for how we express our love for Christ, but we must remember Jesus' words, leave her alone. She gets it. Finally, generosity has the power to reorient our purpose and redefine our legacy. Look at verse 3. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And listen to this. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Jesus highlights the effects of Mary's sacrificial generosity. The whole house was filled with the results of her generosity. Our sacrificial service, our radical generosity, our humble kindness is powerfully influential. Early Christians were known for the way they served and gave themselves and took in those who needed a place to stay. As early as Acts chapter 2, we are told that, 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 that they grew in favor with all the people because of the way they loved one another and they loved uh, those outside of the church family. This idea is the heart of Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5. Towards the end of the Beatitudes, Jesus says this in 14 and, and 16. He says, You are the light of the world. A city on a, uh, set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor can people light a lamp and put it under a basket, put it, but put it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they might see your good works and give glory to your Father who is heaven. You could take the word light there and just replace it with fragrance. Let the fragrance of your offering be smelt, be, be, be taken in, fill up this room, fill up this world, fill up the environments that you find yourselves in. See, our generosity makes an internal impact for the kingdom of God. We are building a legacy when we give ourselves for the glory of Jesus. A legacy that is so much greater than a huge nest egg for our grandkids or a successful career or whatever else we spend our time and our emotions and our, and our drive thinking about. It's a kingdom legacy. In Matthew and Mark's account, they add one verse, one, one detail that, that John doesn't include of the words of Jesus. In, Ma in Matthew 26, 13, he records this. Jesus said, Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, 
what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Mary's legacy is extravagant devotion to Jesus. Those watching, it was like when you heard what the Taj Mahal cost, right? A billion dollars for one person. And those in the room with Jesus, most of them said, $50,000 just on his feet? What are you doing? You're going to spend your entire vacation serving overseas to people who don't believe the same way you do and who, who, who live in, in huts and never heard the name of Jesus? Or you're going to go to eastern Kentucky and serve those in, in poverty in eastern Kentucky? Or you're going to spend your weekends doing something at church so that, that we can get the word out about uh, who we are and, and about who Jesus is? Or are you, are you, you're going to give up that? You're going to give up your opportunity to watch football on Sunday morning because you're coming to a church service? I mean, what, that doesn't make any sense. Now, all those things are menial. All those things maybe sound simple, but that's ultimately what we're... Like, Mary's legacy is extravagant devotion to Jesus that required her to sacrifice greatly of, her, of, her, of, of what she had. Some of us want this easy life of, of coming to church on Sundays and spending an hour here and saying, you know what, I feel good about myself, and now I'm going to serve my needs, right? It's like the tithing principle. I give 10% and 90% is whatever I want to do with it. We do that with our time, but we give much less than 10%. We do that with our service, and we give much less than 10%. God is calling us to give of ourselves for the purpose of making his name known, and that doesn't just happen in the context of the church. It happens in all of our lives, but what are we doing what legacy are we building? Mary's legacy is extravagant devotion to Jesus. And in comparison, Judas's legacy is selfish betrayal and despair that ended in suicide. What will people remember about you? I want to challenge us all to live our lives to be remembered about things that matter. To live our lives, live lives that make a difference in the lives of others, that, that serve the needs of others, that live a life that demonstrates the power of generosity, the, the power to reveal our true treasure, the, the power uh, to, 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 to reorient our purpose, the power to, to redefine our legacy, the power to move the hearts of people around us, to know how great and how glorious our God is. What is your alabaster jar? For, for what purpose are you living? And what legacy are you seeking to build? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you, God, for your grace. Thank you for your word, God, and I pray that um, what we have looked at today, God, would not just be um, an inspiring word, God, but would be something that begins to transform and change our hearts, God, that makes, molds and shapes us into something new and different. God, I pray for, for myself, God. I pray that I, God, would live with radical generosity. I would lead my family to live with radical generosity. God, that we would be intentional about how we spend our time and our money and our giftedness, God. That we, God, would seek to make the biggest difference that we can with the time that we get on this earth. God, the reality is our time on this earth is short, God. We have 60, 70, 80 years, if we're lucky, God, to, to spend on this earth, God, and, 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 and God, that time seems like forever, but God, it, it goes away so quickly, God, but what are we using it for? What is the purpose that we're living for? What is the legacy that we are building? What's the alabaster jar that you are calling us to give up? God, I pray that we would, with open hands, give it over to you. 
God, this, this is not about our comfort. It's not about our happiness. It's not about our, our, our safety or security, God. Because all of those things are only found in submission to you and your will. So God, I pray that we with open hands and open hearts, God, would eagerly long and eagerly listen for you to communicate to us what it is that we need to make our lives about. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and your love. And we ask all this in your name. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one more song out to the Lord.